Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Leah Yard, and I'm a news reporter for the Crimson, and also the co-chair of our diversity committee. And I'm very happy to be here today and to introduce Mr. Lewis Duguid. In his nearly 40-year career at the Kansas City Star, Mr. Duguid has worked as a reporter, an automotive editor, a photographer, a copy editor, a bureau chief, and a letters editor, among several other roles. He has also co-chaired the paper's diversity initiative and has held diversity workshops with his colleagues and with community organizations, including with the Crimson. Um, as a columnist for the Star, he's never shied away from topics relating to race or diversity. Um, he, was a, he is a founding member and president of the Kansas City Association of Black Journalists. Um, in addition to his work at the Star, he's published two books on the history of racial discrimination in America and on the state of the American school system today. In February, he received the Lewis M. Lyons Award for Conscience and Integrity in Journalism and has spent time at Harvard as a Knight Visiting Neiman Fellow. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Lewis Duguid. Well, they told me to turn the microphone on, so I did, and now you're in trouble. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I want to talk about um, why it's important to cover um, communities, um, diverse communities in um, the newspapers that you work for and the, the newspapers that you hopefully will work for, TV stations, radio stations, new media, etc. Um, I want to first give you a bit of the history um, about why this is important. ASNE in uh, 1978 set a goal for journalists of color in newsrooms of America to equal the percentage of people of color in the United States by the year 2000. It looked like a very doable goal, it, especially if you look at the 1980 uh, census of 226.5 million people. 79.5% were white, 11.5% were black, 6.4% were Latino, 3.25% were Asian American Pacific Islanders, 0.78% were Native American, and a total of 21.93% uh, were people of color. But times change. Um, the other piece that uh, is behind ASNE deciding to take this uh, noble step was um, uh, not altogether uh, pretty history in the United States. The riots that occurred in uh, Harlem in 1964, in Watts 1965, in Detroit 1967, uh, and then more than 100 cities blowing up in riots uh, with the assassination of the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr became sort of a key point uh, that told mainstream newspapers throughout the United States that they had a deficiency when it came to people of color um, and who were reporters, photographers, uh, artists, and that led to a deficiency in their coverage of uh, communities that make up the uh, diversity of uh, the United States. Um, the Kerner Commission report, which you can uh, read some of the input there, blamed the news media as much as the people who lit the matches, who looted the stores um, for uh, the rioting that occurred because the mainstream media just were not reporting on the uh, horrible conditions that existed in America's cities, the unequalness um, that had occurred even though the 1954 Brown versus Topeka Board of Education uh, this Supreme Court decision had said that legal segregation was no longer legal. Um, so newspapers, TV stations, etc., were criticized, but they also realized, many of the uh, managers uh, realized that uh, in order to cover the diversity in uh, communities, they had to have diversity in their ranks as well. Um, but they did a poor job of trying to get to that uh, goal of parity uh, by the year uh, 2000. In 1999, the uh, same ASNE report found that only 11.5% of the reporters, copy editors, photographers, graphic artists, and uh, supervisory um, positions at, at news, in newsrooms throughout the U.S. Um, were held by p journalists of color. Now, at the same time, if you remember, the percentage of people of color in the population was just a little more than 21 percent, 
that percentage in the U.S. grew to more than a third uh, of the U.S. population. And by 2042, according to uh, census projections, um, there will no longer be a majority white population. All of the minority populations together will be greater than the white population. So we're, we were chasing in the news industry a moving target. And um, at the same time, we were doing a very, very poor job. Um, so what did ASE and e do uh, in an industry that is built on deadlines? Um, it moved the deadline back uh, to 2025 so that um, uh, there's, there's still the um, very long shot hope that uh, there will be parity in the, in the news industry. But as we've heard all today, the uh, ranks of uh, journalism jobs are shrinking so that uh, it makes it uh, less and less possible to get the diversity that is needed um, uh, for newspapers uh, and radio stations, TV stations, uh, and new media. The problem is that the reason that the as &E goal is important is because um, if you are looking for accurate, honest, and fair coverage of uh, communities of color, then it's important to have people of color who will increase the likelihood that that will occur. I say increase because part of the problem in the news industry is people of color are affected by the same biases that exist in the overall population. So you have to be very aware of hiring people who have the sensitivity and uh, who have the ability to build a rapport in the communities where you might want them to, to cover those stories. The other piece of it is that um, the communities of color, because of the uh, negative depictions that have occurred um, throughout uh, the mainstream media's operation, are really um, very reticent to open up to uh, journalists from mainstream media because they have been um, uh, negatively depicted for uh, so long and they might open their hearts up to people and then only to open the pages of a paper or turn on the TV uh, or look on the internet and see that um, everything got twisted. Um, so you have to, um, as was stated in the uh, earlier session, do more than seagull journalism, come in, poop, and then leave. Um, <laughs> I love that analogy. <laughs> but when you, when you think about um, the reasons for uh, people of color to be there, you, you have to go back to um, Aaliyah's uh, tragic death in uh, the Bahamas. And when that occurred, many newspapers didn't have the black staffers um, working on the copy desk or working on the wire desk to be able to say, this is a huge deal and we need to do stories about that. Um, and, and then, of course, there's the Black Lives Matter movement now in which unless you have people of color, unless, unless you have people who are young, who are able to uh, voice um, uh, for uh, newspaper editors who are mostly clueless the importance of having Black Lives uh, Matter stories in the paper, it won't get covered. I know that when it came to um, Ferguson, Missouri, I'm, uh, I've been with the Kansas City Star for uh, an eternity, and when it came to Ferguson, Missouri, um, Ferguson is on the opposite side of the state in the St. Louis area. We're in Kansas City, the western part of the state. And there's kind of an agreement between, uh, an unwritten agreement between the two newspapers, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch and the Kansas City Star, is that you stay in your part of the state and we'll stay in our part of the state. But this was a big frickin' deal. It was a national story. So when uh, Ferguson blew up with Michael Brown's death um, in, on August 9, 2014, some of us decided that screw the agreement, um, screw what uh, editors have always told us, we're just going to go. Um, and so I drove into St. Louis, which is my hometown, and just um, did some of the reporting for editorials that um, actually ran in the newspaper, took pictures that ran in the newspaper, wrote columns that ran in the newspaper on this, on my time, 
my dime uh, because it was so serious. And there will come a point, um, ladies and gentlemen, in which you will have to say, this is so freaking important. I'm not going to let the papers or the TV station, radio station stupidity prevent me from doing it. Um, but as the Black Lives Matter, which began in the St. Louis area after Michael Brown's death, really became a big issue, um, then it, it showed that taking that stand was, was uh, uh, the right thing to do. Um, I want to digress for a minute uh, to just kind of share with you something that I like to share with the journalism students everywhere. And that is, um, there are the three R's of education. What are they? Okay, reading, writing, arithmetic. There are three R's in journalism. The same, same in some respect. Number one, we have to get people to read because it is a lost and declining art. So they have to go out if they're going to pick up the old fashioned uh, newspaper, the dinosaur blog as they call it, um, to bring it in, unroll it, and then actually read the thing. The second um, piece, and this is huge because the newspaper is such a throwaway thing, and so is um, what you see on the web, probably more so. We have to get them to remember. So the second R is to remember. So much of what you read, you forget. You don't, it has no value except for that moment, that, that thing, and then it's gone. So you have to write your stories in a way that will get people to remember what you've done. And the, the third R is, is to react. You want them to feel so passionate about what you have done that you get them to react, either negatively or positively, but you get them to react so that they say, hey, Martha, did you see what so-and-so wrote in the paper? Or can you believe that this kind of stuff is actually in our newspaper? Or uh, I'm going to give that person a piece of my mind and then they write to you, or they email, or they phone. But you get them to react, and, and when you get them to remember and to react, you've won. There's actually a fourth R. The fourth R is repeat, so that they repeat the process again. They come back to you again, which adds value to your work again, so that your career advances based on you're working that four hours to your advantage. Um, but I wanted to share that with you before going into this um, thing about why diversity matters. The golden rule versus the platinum rule. Who can tell me what the golden rule is? Please, louder, come no, on. Treat others how you'd like to be treated. Absolutely. It's in the Bible. We are supposed to live by it. But tell me what's wrong with the golden rule. Anyone? Not everyone wants to be treated the way I want to be treated. Not everyone's the same. And so um, in diversity circles, and it should hold in journalism circles as well, we must use the platinum rule. The platinum rule instructs us to do unto others or treat others the way they would prefer us to treat them. And that's so very important because we have to get on other people's wavelength in order for them to open up to us to give us the information that we need. Now, in books that I've written on education and on diversity, I say that as journalists we communicate in what I call a currency of conversation. That means that all conversations that we have with people is of value. Everyone, whether you're talking about your sports team or you're talking about what you did last night, it becomes an opportunity to take the conversation into other places where you can learn about the things that matter to you. So that currency of conversation leads to, for, for journalists, we take it down in our notebooks and then uh, from our notes we look at it as notes, but it's actually um, uh, our um, intellectual property 
that allows us to uh, give that uh, or to go back to our newsrooms and and write our stories and and from the the intellectual capital that's in our notes then we turn that into intellectual properties which would be our stories which the newspapers also as as intellectual properties deliver to people and people pay for it and so you have to look at all of it as having this currency that is of value to you people pay for the intellectual property but they also um, pay to um, make sure that that you get paid and so the intellectual um, uh, capital becomes intellectual property becomes a paycheck for you and it's it's very important to tie those things together double consciousness is a term that came from uh, dr wb du bois who was one of the first phd graduates of, of uh, harvard university and he wrote in his uh, 1903 book souls of black folk that african americans possess what he called a double consciousness and that is that we see the world both as africans and in america and as americans and so we have this, this dual lens that allows us to look at things differently and to analyze things differently, to empathize differently. And it gives us an insight into everything that is different. But Latinos have a double consciousness too, which is also different because of their perspective in America. Native Americans have a double consciousness as well. And, and so do Asian Americans. And women have a double consciousness because of who they are as women. And each brings something different to the table when it comes to journalism because they look at things in a, in a different and more creative fashion. Journalism needs all of those abilities to be able to look at things differently so that our stories, our newspapers, our television productions, radio, new media, all are enhanced by this double consciousness. And we, as individuals, learn from other people's double consciousness, which enhances our ability then to do our jobs better. And so, though we might not be this particular group or that particular group by sharing things that are important, and learning from other people's double consciousness, we advance ourselves. Diversity also needs to be looked at as having two hands and two legs. On the one hand, diversity is how we are the same. And a lot of people get stuck on that, thinking we're similar and I can um, engage and talk with you because uh, we're human beings. And that's good. That's okay. But on the other hand, diversity is how we are different. And in journalism, because our news bores the crap out of people in most cases, <laughs> we need that difference. We need that difference to help people navigate their lives and be more creative in, in communicating with other folks. Now, diversity has two legs, too. On, in the one leg, we stand in our workplace or in our communities. And <clears throat> it helps us to be able to communicate with people who are like us and different from us because we have this ability that, that gives us uh, this, this insight. <clears throat> but the other leg of diversity helps us to walk it out of our workplace or our community so that we are able to bring in new resources, new revenue, new ideas, new stories. I guess my point in all this is that it's through <coughs> diversity and journalism that we have opportunity. That opportunity gives you an advantage. We've heard throughout the day people saying that our industry news industry is under siege. And um, in many cases, newspapers, TV stations are trying to figure out ways to reach <coughs> this younger audience. And <coughs> being able to do that is, is difficult. But having the advantage in programs like this, having the advantage of, 
of understanding the value of diversity gives you an advantage of building your career in areas that uh, are underserved, uh, in communities that are underserved, so that you then can um, help yourself to uh, be better and to be a, a greater asset for your, your communities <clears throat> and your newspaper or, or TV station, radio station, new media that you wouldn't be otherwise. I always tell uh, young people this and that you can only be as good as a journalist that's the depth and breadth of your experiences as a human being. And that means you have to get to know people who are not like you. You have to find an ease and a comfort of being around people who are very different from you so that when you do get a chance to engage these individuals, you will feel totally at home, totally at ease, and so will they. Um, so that your stories are deeper and richer than they would be otherwise. And you aren't really put off by what um, these folks might initially come at you um, saying that they don't trust you, they don't know you, but your persistence <clears throat> and your ability to communicate with them uh, will help you to um, show that you're different. And that difference is, is so very critical. Um, most people who go into journalism are like a lot of educators. Um, we come from a majority middle class background, uh, segregated uh, communities that aren't really engaged and deep into the communities that are different, that are diverse. And so um, we bring this, this ability to see just people who are like us, either socioeconomically, racially, ethnically, and it, it limits our ability to look both up, down, sideways, etc. And so having this larger scope, particularly as college students, you have the opportunity now to be able to get to engage people who are different um, opposed to uh, waiting until you get out into the community. And I urge you to do so, uh, take advantage of your school. And I've given you this handout of uh, the five media functions. This comes from Felix Gutierrez and Clint Wilson's uh, book, Minorities in Media, and they've done several uh, editions of this, but it's essentially the same. <clears throat> they, they say that um, the media are broken into five functions. Surveillance, in which we go out into communities to check out what's taking place in those particular areas so that we can report on them. We go to the boring city council meetings, we go to the boring student government meetings, we go to the boring uh, school board meetings, and we tell people what um, took place who otherwise wouldn't have a chance to be able to do that themselves. And people want to know. Our government is built on um, the First Amendment giving people the right to free speech, but free speech means that we have to do the legwork for folks who don't have a chance to be able to get out and do it themselves. Correlation is the connect the dots function of the media. If there is a uh, problem at uh, Cornell University, and there's a similar problem at Yale University, but um, uh, the, there's also the same problem at, at Harvard University, but you guys have such brainy problem solvers that you're able to solve the problem. And through connecting the dots that all of these universities have the same problem, all the universities can also benefit from the same solution. So the correlation of journalism is to tell not only of the problem, but also the solution. Transmission is the socialization function of the media. It's one in which we hold different individuals up for praise and noteworthiness. Um, these are the individuals we want our children to grow up to be like. These are the individuals who've done heroic deeds, who uh, won medals, who um, have done something stellar in the community and we need more people who are like them. Entertainment is uh, the fourth media function, and it is huge and growing. It consists of television, uh, programming, radio, uh, music, um, theater, movies, sports, all kinds of sports, so that it just covers the waterfront of entertainment. And it is totally there, only there, for diversion. 
It's to make you forget your own problems, to laugh, to enjoy, to cry, and, and not worry about your day-to-day -day concerns. The economic function of the media is one uh, that's mostly advertising, but it needs to be broken into two parts. Uh, on one hand, it consists of the um, advertising telling you what products and services are valued by your community. But on the other hand, it tells you who in your community values those products and services. So it, it defines for you quite clearly um, the audience as well as the product and services. In her book, Advertising and Marketing to the New Majority, uh, Gail Baker Woods um, says that you only are able to see the effect of the media when you fracture the media into component parts. In my book, Discovering the Real America, um, I fracture the um, U.S. population into the demographic components which you have in front of you. For uh, African Americans, you have to ask yourself, where do black people show up in representative numbers in the five media functions? And this is where you get to do some work. Who's going to help me out? Anyone? Yes, ma'am. Um, I would say um, that at what, based off of this, it says that African Americans are or make up 13.36 percent of the U.S. population. So where do black people show up in the 13.36 percent um, in any one of these five media functions? Entertainment. Absolutely. According to the media, black people throw a ball, catch a ball, fall on a ball um, better than anybody. Um, and according to the media, um, African Americans sing and dance as good as singing and dancing goes. Um, but where and, of course, I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot one other thing. We are supposed to be very funny. So we entertain on, on all of these different levels. But where else do African Americans show up in representative numbers in the five media functions? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. According to the media, we are the ne'er-do-wells of the population. We are the people who commit the crimes. We are the people who are um, underachievers uh, both in school and at home and in work. We are the problem, uh, folks, um, according to the media. And that's it. So according to the media, African Americans show up in only two of the five media functions. What about Latinos? Where do Latinos show up in representative numbers in the five media functions? And keep in mind that 19% is a huge number. Anyone? Surveillance. Surveillance. Damon, thank you. Um, Latinos, like African Americans, and if you have been following the uh, uh, presidential uh, campaign and certainly anything Trump, um, you know that, uh, African, that uh, Latinos are under siege when it comes to the media. They are um, the uh, troubled people. They are the people who cause problems. They are the people who are changing our way of life, who are taking our jobs, who are coming into this country illegally. Um, never mind that many Latinos have been here for generations, um, yet are tarred with the same brush. Um, and <clears throat> that's it. Latinos show up in only one of the five media functions in representative numbers purely because, or mostly because, of the high percentage. What about Asian Americans? Where do Asian Americans show up? in representative numbers. It's 5% here, <clears throat> but the Asian American percentage is going to grow to 10% um, by uh, 20, 2042, and the Latino percentage is going to grow, by grow to 29% by 2042. Um, 
the African American percentage is going to grow to 16 percent um, by 2042. My ex-wife says I'm an idiot savant with numbers. Um, <laughs> I remember them, but that's why she has an ex. <coughs> <laughs> So where do um, where do uh, Asian American or you know, Asian Americans show up in representative numbers in the five media functions? Anyone? Yes. Uh, transmission. Because Are you the, sure? The model minority. Uh, there is the model minority label, and <clears throat> it certainly would seem justified that Asian Americans would be. Um, in transmission, and they should. However, um, do we see in 5% of the stories that are in uh, the media, in TV and radio and um, magazines, 5% um, of people who are held up for praise and noteworthiness were Asian Americans? No. Falls way off. Any other thoughts? Yes, ma'am. Are you sure? Um, <clears throat> economic, uh, certainly because, you know, we're told, especially in the era of Trump, that the Chinese are taking our jobs, they're producing uh, so many products, um, and they're flooding our markets with goods. Um, but we don't see... 5% of all the ads, whether it's billboards or new media or TV or radio, uh, newspapers, magazines, 5% of the uh, products produced in this, in the, for our market and services that are uh, Asian American, nor do we see Asian Americans in those ads. So it falls way off. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to go with correlation. Are you sure? <laughs> I mean, and, and it, it should be, but, but the, the whole point of correlation is they are uh, connecting the dots. They are individuals who are kind of figuring stuff out for us. Um, but again, that 5%, though it's a low number, it's actually, um, it's, it's actually uh, something that doesn't come close in correlation. Yes, ma'am. Somebody said surveillance, and I already said, are you sure? <laughs> yes, sir. I'm going to go with entertainment. Um, there's only like one left. Dude, fresh off the boat is like it, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, 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 I'm just having fun with you. It's, it's zero. We don't see Asian Americans in the media, and they don't see themselves. Not in representative numbers. And, and that is... Very much like uh, Ralph Ellison's book, Invisible Man, back in the, the 50s, uh, when, when he said that African Americans doing everything right, just living their lives, being taxpaying citizens, raising their family, were invisible. Well, the same is true today for Asian Americans. Now, um, I'm going to jump down here to Native Americans. What about Native Americans? No. No. Same. Oh, you guys are smart. <laughs> there are more than 500 um, Native American uh, federally recognized tribes in, in the U.S. Our Constitution has Native Americans written into it because when it comes to foreign policy, they were the original people who were spoken of uh, for U.S. foreign policy. But we don't see them, and they don't see themselves largely in the media. Um, and that's, that's a problem, because we don't recognize the issues that, that exist. I mean, if you think about the ASNE, uh, not ASNE, but the Kerner Commission report on African Americans back um, in, in the uh, uh, 1968 report, it said that, that part of the problem in the media was that the media were not telling the story of uh, African Americans in this country, and that led to the riots. Well, it's not that there will be riots among Native Americans or Asian Americans, but 
we don't know these individuals and they're not seeing themselves. If they don't see themselves in the media, in textbooks, in our classrooms, then they don't have a feel for um, their inclusion in our history and they don't have a feel for their own future. And I think that we have a responsibility in the media to be able to explain to people um, what's going on. And the other thing is, as our population becomes more diverse, then people are going to want to know, how can I communicate with folks who are not like me? How can I communicate with people who are of a different culture? As journalists, we give them the tools to be able to do that, to be able to have those conversations. Newspapers, I've always said, should be a conversation starter so that it compels people to be able to to talk about something that, that is totally out of their, their realm. <clears throat> now what about uh, gays and lesbians or the LGBTQIA community? Whew. I got it right. <laughs> yes, ma'am. No, no. It was, it was, no, no. Echo, it was echo back here. No. It was entertainment. I'm sure. <laughs> no. Well, let's talk about that. We, we're seeing more and more people who are out and in the entertainment business. But for so long, the media was just terrified of putting people who were gay, outwardly gay, in uh, positions of entertainment because they were very afraid that it would drive away traffic, it would drive away audiences. What they found with shows like Will and Grace and uh, Queer Eye for the Straight Guy is there's a market there. People are enthralled with that. They're, they're curious and they want to know. And um, the folks who are uh, in the LGBTQIA community, they've been there all along. In some cases, they're members of our family. And so why wouldn't we want to know more about them? Um, but we don't see it to the degree that it's 10% um, in the media. And certainly when you factor in sports, um, it's, it's, it falls way off. Yes, sir? Uh, transmission? Really? <laughs> <laughs> okay, transmission is, is the socialization function. It's where we hold different people up for praise and noteworthiness. And yes, there should be individuals who are um, who, who are gay, um, who should be held up for praise and noteworthiness, but not in the media, not uh, 10%, it, it falls way off. I mean, when you think about Byron Rustin uh, helping to get Martin Luther King Jr. to uh, add civil disobedience to the civil rights movement, uh, that's huge. And he should be um, a superstar. Uh, we, everyone should know his name, but, but we don't, because he was someone who had to stay in the background still um, because he was gay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, surveillance? Absolutely. Surveillance, yes, because um, these are people who we have to keep our eye on. These are people who are uh, doing things to our way of life. These are people who um, are seen as uh, un-American, as people. I mean, think about it. it. It's not been that long that it was not a crime. I mean, that it was a crime uh, in many states to be gay um, and to uh, have relationships that were uh, off the chart. I'm going to jump down to people with disabilities. 17% uh, of the population um, has a disability, but with disabilities that you cannot see, it's actually greater than 50%. And as the population ages, those disabilities become more pronounced. Where do you suppose the media, of the, of these folks show up in the five media functions? Yes, ma'am. Really? Um, think about people who have a disability. Do we see them in ads, um, uh, except for the Viagra commercials and Cialis? <laughs> Do we see them showing up in, in representative numbers in the five media functions? No. 
uh, they fall way off. Certainly, 17% is high. Yes, sir? It's a zero. You are absolutely right. We don't see them. They don't see themselves. But they want to be seen as people who have agency over their lives. Uh, Jerry Lewis had uh, done the um, telethons forever about um, people with muscular dystrophy. And the, if you talk to people who have... Um, muscular dystrophy, they really detested Jerry Lewis because it made people who had muscular dystrophy seem so unable to care for themselves, so unable to hold a job. And really, if you know people with disabilities, all they want to, us to do is get out of their way so that they can do their own thing just like anybody else. All right, um, let's jump to Muslims. But let's fracture that into two different parts. Um, first, let's look at it um, uh, before September 11, 2001. Um, where do you suppose Muslims showed up in representative numbers? Yes, and if you know anybody who was Muslim, they would tell you they would love to go back to being invisible. Um, what about after September 11, 2001, particularly with Trump? Surveillance, thank you. Um, you've heard of driving while black. Uh, if you know anybody who's Muslim, they will say that there is flying while Muslim. They know that when they go to an airport, they are going to be the one pulled out of line for the additional surveillance. Their luggage is going to be rifled through. That's just uh, an unfortunate part of um, what's taking place in our times. But your journalism can help to um, bring the real story about Muslims um, to light. Now let's have some fun. What about uh, women? Women make up 52% of the U.S. population. Where do women show up in representative numbers in the five media functions? Yes, ma'am. Yes, indeed. Um, women are in movies and music, and <clears throat> they are in sports, thanks to Title IX. Um, and um, their numbers should be growing. But when we see women on television, and we know that there's the, there are three women's cable channels, Lifetime, We, and Oxygen, they might as well be called the victims' channels because somebody's being chased or stabbed or shot, and some fool is saying, is anybody out there? <laughs> yeah, fool, run! But they never do. Um, <laughs> so entertainment. But with the caveat of it's not real. Do you know real women who are in situations like that? There are a few, but not 52% of the population. Yes, sir? Transition. Are you sure? Um, transmission is the socialization function, and certainly we want our children to grow up to be like women, to be strong in that respect, to have the empathy, certainly, but... When it comes to the media, we don't project women that way. We should, but we don't. Yes, sir? I was going to say uh, economic and possibly correlation. I'll take economic, and let's talk about that first. Um, economic because, guys, I'm sorry, but uh, in this country, um, women control the purse strings in more than 80% of all U.S. households. Women buy things. They buy things for dumb guys like me. They buy this jacket, this tie, this shirt, <laughs> these pants, these shoes. Because, you know, raggedy people like me, they, I'll wait until it's threadbare, okay? And they're like, oh, hell no, you're not going to walk with me looking like that. Um, so women buy things for themselves. They buy things for guys that they're with. They buy things for their children. They buy things for their home. They buy things. The advertisers know that, which is why women are in the ads that are projected for men. If you have any doubt, uh, again, go back to those Cialis and Viagra ads. Who's in them? Women. Um, now, you mentioned, what was the other? I mentioned correlation. Correlation, OK. And I'll have to say, are you sure? Um, women certainly should be, but when it comes to connecting the dots for us to doing the, the hard work of solving problems, the media don't see women as problem solvers. Um, Peggy McIntosh, a good friend who developed the notion of white privilege, 
um, said that in our country, knowledge and information is seen mostly as a male and white trait, and everybody else has to take a back seat. And so women don't fit into that, particularly in the media. But they should. They should. Where else do women show up? Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah. You know, surveillance is like number one on many fronts. Surveillance because women are these poor, helpless damsels, and, and big, strong men have to run in to assist them, according to the media. But also, according to the media, women are the Hillary Clintons of the world, and you have to keep your eye on them because you don't know what they'll do to you. You don't know the kind of power that they will exercise over you, according to the media. All right, so of all of these, women score the highest rank, but with caveats. What about white males? All five? All five? <laughs> Somebody said all five, and whoever said that is correct. Um, white males show up in all five of these, and that's the way it should be. That's the way um, I like it. Because when we see white males in all five of these, we actually get a really good picture of white males. They are individuals who produce products and services. Um, they entertain us in sports and movies and music. They are people we hold up for praise and noteworthiness uh, in transmission. They connect the dots for us. They are our problem solvers. And yes, they do cause some problems too. Um, but on balance, we get a very complete, wholesome, total picture of white males. It is not by accident, ladies and gentlemen, that that occurs. They are the people who have dominated, owned, populated the media uh, since the beginning. And they are the ones who give us a complete picture of people like themselves. But the, the goal in, in this exercise is to show you, A, where the deficiencies are, uh, so that you can then um, understand what you can do to further your careers in sort of looking at these places that are uh, missing uh, in all of these different areas and then tailor your careers to really bringing that out so that it, it helps people to see the value of folks who are not like them. Um, Felix Gutierrez and um, Clint Wilson say that you have to look at the media as being like a bullseye aiming at a mass audience or a target audience. And we aim our stories and our information and the way we actually structure our language at this, this target, this, this homogenous center. And those folks who don't fit within the target fall outside. And they are Asian Americans, they are African Americans, they are Native Americans, they are Muslims, they are... Um, of uh, uh, LGBT, etc. And they um, say that these satellites outside of the target audience are uh, defined by the media as a shorthand of stereotypes. That shorthand is um, both in how we uh, depict these individuals through uh, mostly surveillance as being unlike those in the center and how we um, bring them to light um, either in the stories that we do or the stories that we don't do. Um, something that is uh, really telling is uh, that Walter Lippmann um, explained uh, in, in some of his writing that stereotypes have a, an incredibly powerful uh, influence on society. The subtlest, most pervasive influences are those which create and maintain the repertoire, repertory of stereotypes. In other words, we reinforce them, we value them, we talk about them. Um, we are told about the world before we see it, we imagine most things before we experience them, and those preconceptions, unless education has made us acutely aware, govern deeply the whole process of perception. Um, it's also important as journalists that we view this from an existential perspective. 
we as individuals, as people, are limited because we are not God. We can't see everything, and therefore we take in information, we make decisions, we make decisions that often uh, are based on inadequate amounts of information. That information comes from places like newspapers and TV and, and radio. And we as journalists are trying to provide people with information that will help them navigate their lives better. But when we fall into stereotypes or the isms uh, that are uh, up there, we make existential victims out of people because we don't give them enough information to get past the stereotypes to understand the reality of, of other communities. And we as journalists also are victims of uh, implicit bias so that we take on the, the same qualities of the larger community. Um, in their book, um, well, let me go, okay. Well, let me do Jane Elliott. Jane Elliott, if you've seen the, the video, Class Divided, she says that if you want to raise a racist, sexist, homophobic, elitist, classist, uh, and violent kid, put that kid in front of a TV set and turn it on and walk away, it's guaranteed. In a um, book, um, Journalism Across Cultures, it explains that we as journalists need to know the subjects that we're talking about more intimately than our readers, <clears throat> so that we can explain to them the communities that we're trying to um, enlarge for them, to give them a better understanding, to help them be able to navigate our world and communicate more effectively with people who are not like them. And our journalism affects communities and, and people in those communities, their ability to get jobs, to get a good education, to get the resources from government. Because if those individuals are seen as less than worthy or invisible, then they get nothing. And the implicit bias uh, continues. And some people will call you racist um, for the kind of work that you do and explain to you that you are wrong in <clears throat> trying to bring this new and different kind of journalism to them because um, the kinds of information that they've received from the schools, the education, um, the curricular material, uh, and media in general have all been against valuing diversity. And so when you as a journalist begin to reach into these communities that are different, trust me, you will um, uh, be the subject of a lot of scorn and ridicule. And I want to share with you some of my um, voicemail because it begins to explain what, how people I did that wrong. How people react. Is that coming through?
And that's probably enough. Um, I wanted to share that with you because there are uh, reactions from the public and the public can be extremely uh, harsh. But it's also why we have Donald Trump as president, because these are folks who've been out there, but Trump gives them voice. Um, our journalism is, is so very important in diffusing this, and it's also an opportunity to you to make a name for yourselves and a career amid all of the changes that are occurring in the technical aspect of journalism. I've got a little bit of time for questions, so whatever you guys want, fire away. Yes, ma'am. Um, I know that the Pew Research Center says that there's been a 40% decline in African-American journalists since 1997, and a lot of black journalists feel like that's because, um, I guess when they enter the news force, that they are, I guess, pigeonholed into writing articles about race, um, and they end up leaving the book because they're tired, they're tired of writing about quote-unquote black issues. So what would be your suggestion um, to people of color who are in journalism, but they want to break that mold. Um, this is an age-old concern. Um, in early in my career, we called it the Chitlin Beat. Um, for Latinos, they called it the Taco Beat. Um, it's important that you do the stories that matter to communities that you come from, but also not be pigeonholed in your newsrooms to just those stories. Um, in a session that, that occurred before this one on covering um, diverse communities. Um, there are ways to do that that both talk about the communities that are underserved as well as uh, tie into a national story. Uh, one is the cutbacks uh, that the EPA is facing. That's a national story, but it affects communities of color uh, to a greater extent because those are communities that are uh, more likely to be near toxic waste dumps. And so um, there's a huge story for anybody who has the, the, the stones to actually go after it. Um, but, but this is a perennial concern. Um, you just have to help your editors to understand that, that you're better, you uh, can do more, and yes, by the way, you can do the other thing too. And then help your coworkers to understand there's richness and great stories in communities that are underserved. Other questions? I know I'm good, but I'm not that good. That's a joke, guys. Come on. <laughs> Don't be so serious. Come on. Any questions? Yes, please. Okay, so you've been in the industry for a couple of decades from your bio and everything. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, and this goes for really everyone who's been a journalist in the crazy industry. Like, how do you stay motivated? Um, I, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I like the hunt. I see journalism as the hunt. Um, also, I, I literally grew up in a laboratory. Dad was a chemist and he owned a laboratory and his idea of when my siblings and I should go to work was when we could hold our bladders, our bowels, and a broom. So from age three, I've been working, and, and I haven't stopped working. Um, but Dad's idea of letting us go uh, to do other things was just unacceptable. He wouldn't. And so journalism for me became an opportunity to see what real people are doing, to go where real people are going, to talk to real people. And so it's a childhood dream. So for me, it was something I couldn't let go. Um, I look at it as being like a wolf, and you can't make a wolf stop liking meat. It just isn't possible. And so journalism for me is that, is that hunt that is, is unending. Yes, sir? Um, how do you deal with like the trolls that come after you and like say really personal things, like those voicemails? Like as entertaining as they can be, like it must be like hard to hear sometimes. So, like, how do you deal with people coming after you like that? That's a good question. Um, I always, some people say you must have a thick skin to be able to deal with that, and I'd say just the opposite. I need to be able to hear them. I need to be able to react and respond to them. Otherwise, I mute my effectiveness, um, and I need to be able to respond both journalistically and um, in the emails, letters, faxes, voicemail that I had gotten, 
um, I call them back. I write them back. Um, I email them back. And in some cases, I've gone to lunch and to dinner and to breakfast or off, out for coffee with them so that they can see um, someone who they're not used to being around. Um, and it, it, be, it has become an opportunity for other stories, for other columns, uh, for other things. Um, when I was letter editor, it became an opportunity for them to write letters. Um, so we have to be open to all viewpoints as journalists, whether it is negative or positive. As I you know, mentioned, the three R's of journalism, and actually four, when they react, we win. Um, and you want them to react. You want them to remember. And I've had people uh, stop me on the street and say, I remember back when you wrote something in 1978. Pissed me off, but by golly, I kept reading you and I kept reading you. So you win. How is that wrong if you win? Good question. You guys, join me in thanking Louis for...